Hello again, friends. My name is David, and I'm reading The Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. I'm about to read Chapter 6. To recap, Edmund and Lucy have gotten back from Narnia. Edmund denied it threw Lucy under the bus, and they got to the point where they think Lucy might be going crazy. They take it to the professor, and he says, basically, why don't you just mind your own business? It's essentially what it came to. And they end up in the wardrobe, hiding from Mrs. McCready, and that's where we're at now. Chapter 6, Into the Forest. I wish the MacReady would hurry up and take these people away, said Susan presently. I'm getting horribly cramped. And what a filthy smell of camphor, said Edmund. I expect the pockets of these coats are full of it, said Susan, to keep away the moss. There's something sticking in my back, said Peter. And isn't it cold, said Susan? Now that you mention it, it is cold, said Peter. And hang on, what's this? It's wet too. What's the matter with this place? I'm sitting on something wet. I'm getting wetter every minute. He struggled to his feet. Let's get out, said Edmund. They've gone. Oh, said Susan suddenly, and everyone asked her what was the matter. I'm sitting against a tree, said Susan. And look, it's getting light over there. By Jove, you're right, said Peter. And look there, and there. It's trees all around. And what's this wet stuff? It's snow. Why, I do believe we've gotten into Lucy's woods after all. And there was no mistake in it. And all four children stood blinking in the daylight of a winter day. Behind them were coats hanging on pegs. In front of them were snow-covered trees. Peter turned at once to Lucy. I apologize for not believing you, he said. I'm sorry, will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. And now, said Susan, what do we do next? Do, said Peter, while well, we go and explore the wood, of course. Ugh, said Susan, stamping her feet. It's pretty cold. What about putting on some of these coats? Well, they're not ours, said Peter doubtfully. I'm not sure anyone would mind, said Susan. It isn't as if we wanted to take them out of the house. We shan't even take them out of the wardrobe. Well, I never thought of that, Sue, said Peter. Of course. Now that you put it that way, no one could say that we had bagged a coat as long as you leave it in the wardrobe where you found it. And I suppose this whole country is in the wardrobe. They immediately carried out Susan's very sensible plan. The coats were rather too big for them, so that they came down around their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on. But they all felt a good deal warmer, and each thought the other looked better in their new getup and more suitable to the landscape. We can pretend to be Arctic explorers, said Lucy. This is going to be exciting enough without pretending, said Peter, and he began leading the way forward into the forest. There were heavy, darkish clouds overhead and looked as if there might be more snow before night. I say, said Edmund presently, oughtn't we be bearing a bit more to the left? That is, if we're aiming for the lamppost. He had forgotten for the moment that he must pretend never have been in the wood before. And the moment the words were out of the mouth, he realized that he had given himself away. Everyone stopped. Everyone stared at him. Peter whistled. Phew. So you really were here, he said. That time Lou said she'd met you here, and you made out that she was telling lies. There was a dead silence. Well, of all the poisonous little beasts, said Peter, and shrugged his shoulders, and he said no more. There seemed indeed no more to say. And presently the four resumed their journey. But Edmund was saying to himself, I'll pay you all out for this, you stuck a pack of self-satisfied pricks. Where are we going anyway, said Susan, chiefly for the sake of changing the subject. I think Lou ought to be the leader, said Peter. Goodness knows she deserves it. Where will you take us, Lou? What about going to see Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. He's the nice fawn that I told you about. Everyone agreed to this, and off they went, walking briskly and stamping their feet. Lucy proved a good leader. At first she wondered whether she would be able to find her way, 
but she recognized an odd looking tree at one place and a stump in another and brought them on and on to where the ground became uneven and into a little valley and at last to the very door of Mr. Tumnus's cave. But there, a terrible surprise awaited them. The door had been wrenched off its hinges and broken into bits. Inside, the cave was dark and cold and had the damp feel and smell of a place that had not been lived in for several days. Snow had drifted in from the doorway and was heaped onto the floor, mixed with some black, which turned out to be the charred sticks and ashes from the fire. Someone had apparently flung it about the room and then stamped it out. The crockery lay smashed on the floor, and the picture of the fawn's father had been slashed into shreds with a knife. Whew, that's a pretty good washout, said Edmund. Not much good coming here. What is this, said Peter, stooping down. He had just noticed a piece of paper which had been nailed through the carpet to the floor. Is there anything written on it? asked Susan. Yes, I think there is, said Peter, but I can't read it in this light. Let's get it out into the open air. They all went out into the daylight and crowded around Peter as he read out the following words. The former occupant of these premises, the Fom Tumnus, is under arrest and awaiting his trial on a charge of high treason against Her Imperial Majesty Jadis, Queen of Nardia, Charlatan of Carparavel, Empress of the Lone Islands, etc., etc., also of comforting her said majesty's enemies, harboring spies, and fraternizing with humans. Signed, Mogren, captain of the secret police. Long live the queen. The children stared at each other. I don't know that I'm gonna like this place after all, said Susan. Who is this queen, Lou, said Peter. Do you know anything about her? Well, she isn't a real queen at all, answered Lucy. She's a horrible witch, the white witch. All the wood people hate her. She has made an enchantment over the whole country so that it's always winter and never Christmas. I wonder if there's any point of going on, said Susan. I mean, it doesn't seem particularly safe here and it looks as if it won't be much fun either. And it's getting colder every minute and we've brought nothing to eat. What about we just going home? Oh, but we can't. We can't, said Lucy suddenly. Don't you see? We can't go home. Not after this. It's all on my account that the poor fawn has gotten into trouble. He hid me from the witch and showed me the way back. That's what it means by comforting the queen's enemy and fraternizing with humans. We simply must try to rescue him. Well, a lot we can do, said Edmund. It's not like we even have anything to eat. Shut up, said Peter, who was still very angry with Edmund. What do you think, Susan? I have a horrid feeling that Lou is right, said Susan. I don't want to go a step further, and I wish I'd never come. But I think we must try to do something for whatever his name is. I mean, the fawn. That's what I feel too, said Peter. I'd vote for going back and getting something from the larder, only there doesn't seem to be any certainty of getting back into this country again once we've gotten out of it. I think we need to go on. So do I, said both the girls. If only we knew where the poor chap was in prison, said Peter. They were all still wondering what to do next when Lucy said, look, there's a robin and such a red breast. The first robin I've seen here. I say, I wonder if birds can talk in Narnia. It almost looks as if it wants to say something to us. Then she turned to the robin and said, please, can you tell us where Tumnus the fawn has been taken to? As she said this, she took a step towards the bird. It at once flew away, but only as far as the next tree. Then it perched and looked at them very hard, as if it understood what she had been trying to say. Almost without noticing that they had done, the four children went a step or two nearer to it. At this, the robin flew away again to the next tree and once more looked at them very hard. You could not have found a robin with a redder chest or a brighter eye. Do you know, said Lucy, I really believe he means us to follow him. Well, I have an idea he does, says Susan. What do you think, Peter? Well. We might as well try, answered Peter. The robin appeared to understand the matter thoroughly. It kept going from tree to tree, always a few yards ahead of them, but always so near that they could easily follow them. In this way, it led them on and on, slightly downhill. Wherever the robin alighted, a little shower of snow would fall off the branch. Presently, the clouds parted overhead and the winter sun came out and the snow all around them grew dazzlingly bright. 
They had been traveling this way for about a half an hour with the two girls out front when Edmund said to Peter, if you're not still too high and mighty to talk to me, I have something to say, would you better listen to? <laughs> What's that? asked Peter. Hush, not so loud, said Edmund. There's no good frightening the girls. But have you realized what we're doing? What, said Peter, lowering his voice to a whisper. We're following a guide we know nothing about. How do we know which side the bird is really on? Why shouldn't it be leading us into a trap? Well, that's a nasty idea. Still, a robin, you know, they're always good birds in the stories I've read. I'm sure a robin wouldn't be on the wrong side. Well, if it comes to that, which is the right side? How do we know that the fawns are on the right side? And the queen, yes, I know, she, we've been told she's a witch, is wrong. We don't really know anything about either. Well, the fawn saved Lucy. He said that he did, but how do we know? And there's another thing too. Has anyone the least idea the way to get home from here? Great Scott, said Peter. I hadn't thought of that. And no chance of dinner either, said Edmund. Tune in next time for chapter seven.